In this session, we're going to begin a series in the field of eschatology. Now, I know for some of you that term sounds a little bit technical, but it's a, a, a common term in theology, and eschatology is a subdivision of systematic theology that is particularly concerned about the last things, or the future things, or what we call the last days, coming from the Greek word for last times. Now, when we enter the arena of eschatology, we enter a fascinating uh, subject, but one in which there's very little consensus among Christians. There's probably more disagreement about matters relating to eschatology among Christian people than in, among all of the other doctrines that tend to divide us uh, put together. And because of that, there has been something of a crisis in our time in terms of trying to understand the teaching of Scripture with respect to future prophecy. Now, I need to alert you at the beginning that as I canvass some of these issues of eschatology in this series, I'm going to be taking a position on eschatology that is a minority report. And in fact, it'll be a viewpoint on eschatology that many, if not most of you who are uh, hearing this, will be hearing for the first time, perhaps. And it may even come as a shock to you to hear some of the positions that I take, because my own thinking on eschatological matters has undergone uh, a transition from earlier times. I've been uh, through various stages in my own understanding of these things. And even where I come down today, I come down not with a fierce dogmatism, because that's a dangerous thing to do with respect to eschatology, because the subject itself is so difficult. I'm going to be following, basically, the structure and pattern of the content that I set forth in this book entitled, The Last Days According to Jesus, and then subtitled, When, when Did Jesus Say He Would Return? So, as I said, <coughs> there's less of a consensus in eschatology than perhaps any other aspect of theology. And we repeatedly hear about debates concerning the time and nature of the millennium, which is predicted in the book of Revelation, the question of the relationship of Old Testament Israel to the New Testament church, issues over the identity of this mysterious figure that we call the Antichrist, questions about the nature and the time of the rapture, and the relationship between the return of Jesus and the biblical concept of the rapture. Now, these are the kinds of issues that I assume most of us are aware of. But what I want to uh, focus attention on, not just today, but throughout this series, is another crisis of eschatology that is often overlooked or ignored within evangelical circles of the Christian church, which crisis, I believe, is the, the most serious crisis of all with respect to our understanding of future prophecy. And that crisis has to do with the question of credibility. And it has to do with the credibility of two distinct objects. First of all, it has to do with the credibility and trustworthiness of the Bible itself, as I will try to show you. And secondly, it has to do, even more importantly, with the credibility of Jesus himself. And that's why I'm concerned to look at what Jesus taught about 
the last things. I won't be covering many of the common issues of eschatology, interpretations, for example, of the book of Daniel and the 70 weeks in the Old Testament and that sort of thing, because I'm going to be focusing more on the New Testament and specifically the teaching of Jesus. For this reason, the point that is often overlooked among evangelicals is that for the last 200 years, there has been an unprecedented assault against the trustworthiness of the Scriptures. Now, it's not that there was never criticism of the Bible prior to the Enlightenment, but since the Enlightenment, there has been a radical escalation of criticism leveled against the believability, the credibility of the biblical documents. And that attack has not come simply from outside the church, but for the most part, in the last century or so, the guns of criticism have been leveled against the authority of the Bible from inside the church. Now, there are many reasons why the higher critics level their attacks against the authenticity of sacred Scripture. But far and away, the number one central point of attack of higher criticism against the uh, inspiration and authority of the Bible focuses on matters relating to eschatology. It's been said that two-thirds of the content of the New Testament deals with future prophecy. And if that prophecy is suspect, with respect to criticism, then, of course, that raises serious questions about our whole understanding of the nature and credibility of the Bible. I'll just give you a little personal uh, uh, anecdote in terms of my own background in studies. When I was a seminary student in an institution that was not known for its passion for Christian orthodoxy, in which I was exposed to most of the radical theories of our day concerning the Bible, it seemed like there was no end to the professors criticizing the integrity of the Bible, particularly with respect to the predictions found in the New Testament regarding the coming of Christ and future ad events that surrounded it. As I say, the critics focused on these issues in their assault on the uh, trustworthiness of the Bible. Now, even more significant than the question of the credibility of the Bible is, of course, the credibility of Christ Himself. Uh, even outside the church, there are those who, though they do not accept the deity of Christ, will affirm that he was a great teacher or that he was even a prophet. But when we examine the future prophecies of Jesus, the critics come to these and say that the prophecies that Jesus made with respect to the future did not come to pass within the specific time frame that he said they would come to pass. And if that is true, namely, if the prophecies of Jesus fail to come to pass in the time frames in which he said they would come to pass, that would, bottom line, reduce Jesus to the role of false prophet. So let me just pause for a second here and say, my two biggest concerns as I approach these questions of New Testament prophecies are to deal with the critical attack against the Bible on the one hand and against the teaching of Jesus Himself on the other hand. Let me illustrate this uh, problem as we discover it, not simply among biblical scholars, which we will look at later, <clears throat> but as it is uh, summarized for us in the 
famous criticism leveled at Christianity by the British philosopher Bertrand Russell. Russell published a little book entitled, Why I Am Not a Christian. And in that book, he gave a series of criticisms against historic Christianity, against arguments for the existence of God, and so on. But he focused his attention on the central importance of Jesus to historic Christianity. He came at this problem saying that in his opinion, religion in general and Christianity in, in particular is positively harmful. The net impact on the human race and the uh, safety of culture and civilization of religion, according to Russell, has been negative all the religious wars and the hostilities and the fighting and the prejudice and the witch hunts and all of that that are part of the blemish of church history, he uh, puts all together in one package and says the, the, the bottom line is that the net result of religion is harmful. And he said that he thinks that it was doubtful if there ever was a Jesus of Nazareth. That is, from a historical perspective, Russell doubted whether Jesus ever lived. Now, he's not alone in that, as we have seen many critical theories, particularly in the 20th century in the various quests for the historical Jesus, that have raised questions about whether Jesus is completely mythological and an invention of the biblical writers have, and never really existed in space and time. And we've seen the radical criticism of the Jesus Seminar even in our own day that uh, uh, play around the edges of this kind of thinking. Yet, at the same time, Bertrand Russell made a distinction between the, the real historical Jesus, which he doesn't think we can know, and the Jesus that is presented to us in the literature of the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels. Now, he did have some good things to say about Jesus. He had a certain degree of respect for the moral character of Jesus, at least the Jesus who appears in, uh, in the New Testament documents. You know, I find that somewhat fascinating as a parenthesis because even the most uh, fierce critics of Christianity find it difficult to attack the personal integrity of the Jesus of the New Testament. One, on one occasion, George Bernard Shaw was criticizing Jesus uh, for teaching one of the things he taught, and he said, on this particular occasion, Jesus didn't uh, behave like a Christian. And I thought that was somewhat funny, that when he was leveling this criticism, he couldn't think of any higher standard by which to judge Jesus than the standard of Jesus himself. But beyond that, Bertrand Russell said that though the, the Christ of the Gospels displays a high ethical and moral character, he does not display a great deal of wisdom. Isn't that interesting that this one who has been regarded as the greatest teacher who ever trod the earth was considered by Bertrand Russell to be not particularly wise. Now, his question regarding the wisdom of Jesus focused chiefly on Jesus' teaching about the future. Now, let me give you a quote from Bertrand Russell where Russell says, and again I quote, he, that is Jesus, certainly thought that his second coming would occur in clouds of glory before the death of all the people who were living at that time. Jesus certainly thought that his second coming would occur in clouds of glory before the death of the people who were living at that time. That's the chief criticism of Bertrand Russell. And I might add 
that that is the chief criticism of the biblical critics and the biblical scholars of the last 200 years. Namely, that Jesus thought and taught that he would return, that he would appear, that he would come again, that his parousia, his coming or manifestation of himself, would occur within a certain time frame, a time frame that was restricted to the first century and to the context of no more than 40 years from the time that he predicted it. Now, the three texts that most scholars make reference to and all of which were referred to by Bertrand Russell in his criticism of the New Testament at this point are these. First of all, the statement that Jesus made to his disciples in Matthew 10, 23, you shall not have gone over all the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Now here Jesus says that they, namely the disciples, would not finish their missionary outreach beyond the sphere of all of the cities of Israel before the Son of Man, and the Son of Man is a title, obviously, that is Jesus' favorite self-designation. He's talking clearly about himself here. Until the Son of Man be come. Now again, how long did it take the early church to finish their mission of spreading the gospel across the city of Israel? Long before the end of the first century. It certainly hasn't taken up till the modern day for that mission to have been completed. And so here is a time frame that Jesus gives. You won't go over all the cities of Israel until the Son of Man be come. Now second, there are some standing here that shall not taste death until the Son of Man comes into his kingdom. Now again, Jesus is addressing his contemporaries and of those who were crowding around to hear him speak. He makes this statement, some of you, he's not talking about us, he's talking to the people who were there listening to his prophecies. He said to them, some of you will not taste death until <coughs> the Son of Man comes into his kingdom. Now, we're going to look at that later on, and of course, I ask the question immediately, what does Jesus mean by coming into his kingdom? Was he referring to his second advent, or was he referring to some other event? That's one of the questions that we will examine. But for now, just remember that this is the second uh, text that uh, uh, Bertrand Russell cites as, uh, as evidence of the failure of Jesus' prophecies to come to pass. The third one, which is perhaps the most problematic of all, and the one that we will be taking great pains to examine in this series, is the statement we find in Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 30, in which Jesus declared to his disciples after he had talked in great detail about his coming in glory, that he said, quote, This generation will by no means pass away until all of these things take place. This generation will not pass away until all of these things be fulfilled or come to pass. Now, what do you do with that? The way in which uh, uh, evangelical scholars have handled these time frame references uh, have uh, been in many cases far less than satisfying. 
It's certainly not satisfying to the critics who say that the plain and obvious meaning of Jesus' words in these texts are that he intended to manifest himself to come again in glory within the framework of no longer than a generation. And in Hebrew terms, a generation is approximately 40 years. Now, in addition to these three critical texts, Russell and others point to a host of other statements in the Scriptures that indicate that the early church, the apostolic community, and certainly the Apostle Paul, that these writers all had a sense of urgency about the nearness or the imminence of the coming of Christ. And yet, according to the critics, those things that Christ predicted would take place within a span of 40 years have not taken place even to this day. The book of Revelation, which is the favorite uh, source for speculation about future matters and the return of Jesus, also contains time frame references that we'll look at that speak about those things that must shortly come to pass. And if the book of Revelation in its, uh, its majority of its content is referring to the final consummation of the kingdom of Christ and His final appearing in history, it's hard to see, since it's been 2,000 years since the book was written, uh, in any way that we examine this, that that which was promised to take place shortly can hardly take 2,000 years and still be considered shortly unless we spiritualize these words and talk about a day in the Lord's sight as though a thousand years and so it's only been two days since the prophecy has been given and so on. But in light of the teaching of the documents of the New Testament, it is clear that the early church, the early Christian community had this urgent sense of expectation. And, of course, the critics say that when time began to pass and these things did not occur as had been predicted, certain adjustments were made to their expectation so that as the later books of the New Testament appear, there is more room left open for a long gap in history before the times of fulfillment take place. But that's the kind of thing that we're going to be looking at here. But the major concern of this series will be to focus on how we understand these time frame references that people have used to criticize both the credibility of the Bible and the credibility of our Lord Himself.